Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Sunil Mehta, Chief Executive IBA. I feel privileged this evening to extend my warm welcome to all dignitaries and guests for the talk on corporate governance by none other than Sri Narayan Murthy Ji, founder and chairman, Emeritus, Infosys, and well, very tall leader of the corporate India. I need not introduce Sri Narayan Murthy Ji. His prominence is much eco and vibrated by not only the Indian industry, but equally by the international business community. Sri Narayan Murthy Ji is a man of distinct vision and fountainhead illuminating ideas and an idol of knowledge, value system, and inspiration to all of us. Sir, you have made us proud of your distinguished work in numerous capacities. On behalf of Indian Bank Association, I thank you for honoring us with your gracious presence this evening and having accepted our invitation to deliver talk on corporate governance. We look forward to hear you and get benefit of your insight in the realm of corporate governance. May I now request Chairman IBA Shri Rajkiran Raiji to speak few words. Thank you. Um, yeah, respected uh, Shri Narayan Murthy Ji, co-founder and chairman emeritus of Infosys. Shri Ashwini RD, CEO of Capgemini Technology Services. Shri Sunil Mehta Ji, Chief Executive of IBA. The leadership team of all member banks of Indian Bank Association, ladies and gentlemen. When we talk of corporate governance, primarily we are referring to the code and conduct of decision makers of a company. It is about set of systems, processes and principles which ensure that a company is governed in the best interest of all stakeholders. It is about promoting fairness, transparency and accountability. It is about commitment to values, about ethical business conduct and about making a distinction between personal and corporate funds in the management of a company. While these aspects are known to every management and firm, very few have been able to practice it in letter and spirit. Last few years in particular have challenged the all good narrative of corporate governance in India with several high and mighty firms and their distinguished management violating the trust of people. Unfortunately, those interested to keep a vigilant eye have not covered, covered themselves in glory either. We needed to build a systemic response in terms of legal architecture and regulatory capacities. A lot has been achieved in these years. More importantly, however, we need to discover the inherent virtues of business that values ethics, honesty, and integrity over any profit and loss gains. It is an honor to welcome Sri Narayan Murthy ji for this webinar on corporate governance. Sri Murthy exemplifies best of human virtues that India incorporation champions. Much before corporate governance became a currency of boardroom conduct, Sri Murthy led Infosys with a personal example, setting highest standards for ethical leadership, ushering transparency and accountability towards stakeholders. Most importantly, living responsibly as corporate citizen. Sri Murthy institutionalized practices beneficial to the community, creating trust in India incorporation and earning respect for Indian talent globally. He has been a master of ethical wealth creation. In Sri Murthy, we have a perfect blend of Oriental wisdom and Western business leadership, having the ability to combine emotional domain with cognitive domain leading strategically towards the grand vision. His ideas set the template for future leaders on how to build their businesses without yielding to short-term short-termism. Thank you for agreeing to address the banking and finance community. We are eager to hear you, sir, the great man of India, sharing his mind and experiences of navigating a challenging environment. On behalf of Indian Banks Association, I thank you for honoring us with your gracious presence this evening and having accepted our invitation to deliver a talk on corporate governance. We look forward to hear you, sir, and benefit from your insights and the, and the, in the real realm of corporate governance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dai. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Now I would like to invite Mr. Vishal Dixit, who is the Managing Director of Capgemini Financial Services, to come and uh, formally introduce Mr. Narayan Murthy. Vishal, over to you. Thank you so much. Hello and a very warm welcome to all of you. 
and the topic we are going to discuss today is very interesting and ever evolving. So last 20 years of corporate governments in banking has changed drastically. Uh, uh, I mean, some some names that comes to mind are Lehman Brothers, Enron, and if you look at closure to home, Satyam, right? So this is triggered immediate action and various committees were set up to institutionalize corporate governance and transparency framework in various parts of the world. So strong policies around corporate governance of banks is essential and critical because size and complexity of financial institutions are growing by the day. And if these are not checked, it can actually have serious financial stability implications. Right. So even after so many measures, we still uh, have instances uh, in the banking and financial sector, which we have very recently foreseen. Uh, clearly, people are finding loopholes in these policies. Therefore, there is need to have continuous discussion and reviews to identify areas of improvement uh, and immediate amendments to the policy. So RBI uh, has recently released the discussion paper in June 2020 on corporate governance in banking <clears throat> aiming to empower board of directors and to set the culture and value transparency in the organization. Uh, if you talk about bit about Capgemini, we place great significance important on, importance on compliance uh, with the value and principle which guide the guide and inspire its section and therefore we welcome open conversation on this very important topic uh, today we have very strong panel here we have an eminent guest who need no introduction uh, welcome mr narayan murthy welcome you sir um, under his leadership infosys become a leader in innovation and technology managerial and leadership training software technology quality productivity so on and so forth he has advised various government around the world on technology and chaired various committees. He led SEBI's corporate governance committee and suggested key amendments to the policy. So who would be the better person to talk about this particular subject? Without wasting much time, let me turn the table around to the panel and start the discussion. Deepshika, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Vishal. It's uh, such an honor, uh, Mr. Murthy, to be uh, to be sitting here together with you. We also see that uh, on this panel itself, in this we have the custodians of India's wealth uh, together coming on one uh, platform. I would also want to thank uh, Sunil Mehta ji, uh, Raj Kiranji, Vishal, uh, and the team speaking to have uh, put this event together. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Murthy, once again. And without further ado. Let me straightly jump into the questions and uh, start a conversation to hear uh, Shrimurti's views on corporate governance. So shall we begin? Yeah. Fantastic. So the first question uh, coming to you as the context was said by Raj Kiranji and, and that by Vishal, we're talking about improving corporate governance within organizations. But as we see that improving corporate governance within an organization is always seen as a work in progress. It does not often reach its realization. What do you think, sir, are the steps that organizations need to follow to raise the bar of corporate governance today? Uh, first of all, thanks to the chairman, thanks to the executive director, thanks to Vishal, and thanks to you, Shita, for this opportunity. I'm very, very grateful to every one of you. The most important uh, initiative that we all have to take is to change the culture of the country. In other words, unless there is a cultural transformation in India, I don't think economic transformation will be easy to implement. I believe that the culture of a nation determines how its public institutions develop, sustain, and operate. It takes long years to make these institutions strong. Even in countries where institutions are strong, one misguided individual, as we saw recently, supported by by the silence of the powerful and the elite can weaken these institutions. It will take a long time to rebuild it. Countries like India were under the control of foreign invaders for almost a thousand years. We lost the sense of commitment to the society. This was because Indians thought 
that the society or what was public belonged to somebody who was either in Europe or Uzbekistan or Afghanistan. <laughs> Therefore, Indians focused on making their families strong and plundering commons that Indians considered as belonging to these invaders. This mindset developed over a thousand years, will take a long time to change. Let us be very, very clear. Therefore, wealth belong to a, belonging to a corporation or deposits in a bank have been considered as per, as a per perfect game for plundering by the rich and the powerful. The problem of poor corporate governance stems from this mindset. The deficits in corporate governance in India stem from the primary problem of increasing agency costs and related party transactions that benefit the owner managers and the professional managers. This problem translates to using public resources illegally to make oneself richer. This problem will be reduced when there is a cultural transformation in India, as I spoke about, and when using, pub using public money for personal benefits will be punished heavily. And when the society ostracizes such offenders very severely. Thank you very much, sir, on that um, uh, response. So my next question is on the alignment of all stakeholders. How do we get alignment of all stakeholders in building awareness? implementation and most importantly in measuring the effectiveness of corporate governance. The leading question sir to that is what tools need to be deployed to measure corporate governance? Now first of all the best way to eliminate such deficits or reduce the number of such deficits, deficits is for a board member or a CXO to ask if such an action, such a decision would enhance respect for him or for her in the eyes of the society. We have to accept that respect is more important than wealth and power. Second, the board members must be made to realize that they serve to enhance the interest of every shareholder and stakeholders. Today, there is a feeling among many board members in India that they operate at the pleasure of either the CEO or the chair. Of course, there is also the feeling among the bureaucrats that serve the boards of public sector banks that they are not accountable to individual shareholders, even though they may be in minority, and that they are accountable only to their bosses sitting in Delhi or at the state capital. So increasing accountability to every shareholder is important. Directors should not be appointed by the government for listed public sector banks, but they should be appointed only by shareholders through voting. These directors must be held accountable to every shareholder. Third is to improve transparency to every shareholder on every important decision of the board. Full transparency must be provided to the report of investigation of any governance problem undertaken by an outside agency. Fourth, the board should recuse itself and appoint a set of respected and accomplished members of the society when any member of the board or when any one of the CXOs is accused. Fifth, SEBI may want to mandate the training of every incoming board member on the basics of business and governance, give them a test, and then certify if they can indeed be admitted to the board. The candidates for chairmanship must undergo additional training and certification. Sixth, 
boards have to conduct an annual peer survey among the board members on their performance of on the performance of each member of the board the chairman generally sits with each member of the board discusses his or her performance suggests remedies for weaknesses and drops him or her if the performance has not improved after two evaluations the chairman's performance is handled by the lead independent director along with two respected and accomplished members of the society who are experts in that particular business field seventh any deficits created by board members must be punished heavily by clawing back the fee received by the board member and an additional fine in some cases the board members may have to face criminal charges i believe that if we implemented these suggestions that i have pointed out there will be a deterrent for the members of the board and, and the cx force to indulge in creating corporate governance deficits so a leading question to that you talked about transparency and you talked about a lot of uh, different ways in which board can can help so the transformatory approach towards towards taking a business forward today requires the pillars of as you mentioned transparency ethics impact purpose and technology what is the role sir the boards have to demonstrate in line with these pillars well you know i already spoke about transparency now i'll focus on technology and ethics they will automatically drive impact and purpose and all of that technology improves productivity customer base employee connectivity quality speed of response and, and customer and investor friendliness technology is also a great leveler and enhance transparency and the confidence of the lowest level employee who works in the company therefore it is very important that every new board member must undergo a course on technology relevant to the business for example in banking relevant to banking from the perspective of its use its costs and its benefit let me now come to ethics and values purpose of every well meaning board member has to be to make the institution strong that requires upholding the values of the institution values depend on the culture as i pointed out earlier culture of an individual is usually developed pretty early by parents grandparents other relatives siblings early teachers and in some cases by bosses you can also observe role models and learn from them i had the fortune of working with john m huntsman when john was the chairman of the board of overseers at the wotton school of business and i was a member on the board of overseers i learned so much from him i have his book the winners never cheat on my ipad i will repeat verbatim this the subtitles of nine chapters of this wonderful must read business book i would request every one of you to kindly buy this book and use it as your business gita or your quran or your bible or agamas or granth sahib or your torah or your avesta the titles are circumstances may change but your values should not the second title is everything we need for today's marketplace we learned them as kids as children third subtitle we know damn well what is right and what is wrong nobody needs to tell us fourth subtitle compete fiercely and fairly but no cutting in line 
fifth subtype risk responsibility or accountability and reliability are the three hours of leadership sixth subtype surround yourself with associates who have the courage to say no to you seventh subtype revenge is unhealthy and unproductive learn to move on eighth subtype treat competitors colleagues employees investors vendors and customers with respect the ninth and the last subtitle is acceptable values are child's play it's not a rocket science this is what i learned what i have learned from my wonderful friend john huntsman I, and in my own small way i read this as often as i can and try to see if i, I can practice it that is wonderful so i mean that goes beyond uh, corporate governance leadership and more wonderful wonderful piece of uh, advice there sir uh, i would say then uh, come back to the point on technology which you very beautifully mentioned it's no longer an option or a man- vanity metric for an organization and the pandemic sir has made it very very clear that it is a necessity what are the top outcomes that can be expected of uh, the adoption of latest technologies by the banks and second what are the expectations from ceos and their functional leaders to make the technology adoption process seamless well i think there are several banks in india both in the private sector and the public sector that have adopted technology well and succeeded so you have role models right here amongst ourselves in banks like sbi hdfc icici axis bank and foreign banks why is technology important for banks technology is about the depth of distance and depth of time zone differences it is about raising productivity planning and improving the quality and speed of execution of projects improving comfort improving governance by enhancing transparency and accountability and reducing the cost of services provided by the banks to the customer who needs these more than the poor people and the emerging nations most importantly technology is a great lever that providing the same quality the same courtesy and the same speed of services at the same cost to everyone whether you are rich or poor powerful or weak urban or rural and educated or uneducated let me take a few minutes and tell you a story of uh use of technology at infosys and how it brought the democratization of services it was 1995 and my wonderful friend kv kamat agreed to install an atm from icici in our campus that was the first private sector company or any company in india to install an atm on their campus and uh, after a couple of weeks i was standing in queue at our cafeteria and in front of me was one of the janitors who would clean the various conference rooms and i struck a conversation with him and i asked him mr so and so how do you find this new gizmo that is the atm he broke into a smile and he was very happy and he said sir i like this atm very much i said why do you like it very much he said sir this machine treats me exactly the same way it provides me whatever information i want it provides me money 
when I put my car with the same speed as it would treat the suited and booted software engineers and managers. Now, that was a big revelation to all of us that technology is a great leveler. Technology does not distinguish whether you are rich or poor, weak or strong, urban or rural, and educated or uneducated. Therefore, technology in banks enhances the confidence of the poor, the weak, and the disenfranchised in a nation. Financial inclusion, ATMs, and in internet banking are all good examples of this. Let me stop here. Wonderful example again, sir. Uh, you talked about ethical behavior, sir. Let me just ask a question on that uh, uh, aspect. A fundamental component of good governance is a culture of reinforcing appropriate norms for responsible and ethical behavior. These norms are especially critical in terms of banks' risk awareness, risk-taking behavior, and risk management. To promote a sound culture, and you talked about it earlier, sir, it is thus essential for the board to reinforce the tone at the top. What are the some ways to do that, sir? I think I agree with you. Infosys culture is explained by the acronym C Life, C L I F E. That is C stands for customer focus, L stands for leadership example, I stands for integrity and transparency, F stands for fairness in every transaction with everybody, and E stands for excellence in execution of every task. Of these, I believe that leadership by example is the most impactful instrument. Mahatma Gandhi expounded, expounded it. Now, let me tell you another story. It is not apocryphal, apocryphal. It is an actual story. You know, Mahatma Gandhi believed that to understand India, he had to live like a common man or a common woman. Therefore, he insisted on traveling by third class. He instead on, insisted on eating whatever food was uh, given at the railway station. He rarely used any, you know, expensive, he didn't use any expensive clothes, all of that. So when he was traveling, there used to be a lot of crowds who would try to get into his uh, compartment and all of that. So therefore, there had to be many plain clothes people trying to protect Gandhi because they were scared. Some crazy guy may kill Gandhiji or somebody from the government, the, some British guy may provide uh, him food with poison and may kill him, et cetera, et cetera. So there were lots of plain clothes people. His compatriot, Sarojini Naidu, once said, and you know, you know she used to take a lot of uh, uh, freedom with Mahatma Gandhi. She said, it takes a fortune to keep this man in poverty. So therefore, everybody realized that it is worthwhile spending that, that fortune because Mahatma Gandhi led by example, he understood the power of leadership by example, and therefore it was all worth it to teach, a, to communicate a lesson to uh, half a billion Indians. Therefore, I believe that the best way to create trust and confidence in youngsters in, in the words of the leaders that are assembled here is if they practice their precept and walk the talk. In an organization or in every bank, everybody, every employee is focusing on the leader's words and actions very intently every minute because they want to imitate the leader, whether it's him or her. Therefore, the best way to make your people subscribe to the organizational culture is for the leader to lead by example. Now, a leader 
will not be able to interact with a lot of employees due to paucity of time. It's understandable. Therefore, the leader will have to create lots of messengers from among those that he interacts with. These messengers will have to communicate the culture of the company through leadership by example, by walking the talk and practicing the precept. You have to tell real life stories of the company handling tough situations and crises and how values gave the leaders mental strength to handle these crises and tough situations. You have to conduct yourself so that the message goes to the these immediate uh, subordinates who become the messengers. For example, if you want people to come to the office on time, you don't have to tell them 10 times. All that you need to do is that if the office opens at 8 o'clock, be there at 7.45 every day, that message will spread like wildfire. And what will happen is these messengers will use your own story that you are very austere, you travel by economy, you come to the office on time, you focus on excellence in everything, you focus on ethics, etc. And that, that will automatically spread to everybody as wildfire. And that is so much better than telling people hundreds of times. Leaders may also conduct leadership training programs for potential leaders and use examples from their own decisions in the company taken based on the company culture and values to communicate the power of institutional culture and values. At Infosys, we founded the Leadership Institute and every leader was expected to spend nine days in a year, nine full working days in a year, teaching three times uh, a, a program of three days each. And we used to select people, leaders at different levels to attend these programs. We had tier one, tier two, and tier three. Therefore, there are many, many ways by which we can indeed communicate the values, communicate the, the, the importance of ethics. But the most important thing is through your action, that is through leadership by example. Now, risk identification and mitigation are two extremely important functions of board members. I used a concept called PSPD, that is predictability of revenues, sustainability of these predictions quarter after quarter, profitability from those revenues, and finally, de-risking. At Infosys, we had identified about 127 risk factors, and we used to monitor them, monitor them some daily, some weekly, some monthly, and some quarterly. We had also designed the boundary limits that the lower uh, uh, boundary limit and the upper boundary limit for each parameter. The moment any of these 127 parameters near either the top boundary limit, in other words, it was within 10% of the top boundary limit or 10% of the bottom boundary limit, there would be an alert and then that manager as well as his boss. And in some cases, it would go to the CEO saying that there is a risk in, in the uh, company and therefore you will have to take uh, immediate action. So I think uh, it is possible, but we need to train our board members in the risk factors that the bank faces and the levers that you can use to reduce those risks. Let me stop here. Fantastic. 
So you did mention different uh, different parts of leadership and PSP was was wonderful, but you also talked, sir, about tough situations and crisis handling. Let me talk about uh, uh, now another aspect here. So today there is an unprecedented discussion on the importance of whistleblower policy in banks. The proponents, including the RBI, strongly argue that it is essential to operationalize and communicate this policy to the relevant stakeholders, including the employees. What are your views on making this policy efficient, sir? According to Wikipedia, a whistleblower is a person who exposes information about a secretive, illegal, and unethical activity that is supposed to have taken place in a private or a public institution. The whistleblower may be an internal employee or an outsider. While whistleblowers have been given considerable protection by the law, they may still face protracted legal action, criminal charges, and and in a society like India, they may even face social stigma. It is very important that whistleblowers are totally honest in their complaint. Whistleblowing should not become an act of revenge by a disgruntled employee. The whistleblower must substantiate his or her complaint with the data and facts, else they'll be guilty of maligning innocent people and harming the reputation of the organization. No whistleblower has the right to harm an organization or an institution or a company on which a large number of families depend for their livelihood. Having put in these caveats, uh, let me say that a corporation or a bank or whatever it is must provide total protection to whistleblowers against vendetta by the bosses. I would even suggest a reward to a whistleblower based on how critical the issue was. How should boards address such a complaint? An important duty of a board is protecting and enhancing the reputation of the bank and discharging its fiduciary responsibilities. Therefore, addressing a whistleblower complaint in a transparent and trust-enhancing manner is an absolute must. If the complaint is against a middle or a low-level employee, an internal committee consisting of senior employees not connected with the department of the accused, I am totally committed to fairness and transparency should be sufficient. On the other hand, if the complaint is against any member of the board, including the chairman, the CEO, an executive director, or an officer of the bank, there is a tendency amongst most Indian boards to investigate such complaints themselves, assisted by an outside law firm. This is not a good idea. You cannot be the judge, the jury, and the defendant. Is there a solution? Yes. The boards of some globally reputed companies totally recuse themselves from the investigation of the complaint in such situations. The top 10 shareholders, some of whom may be institutional investors, invite a committee of highly respected individuals in the society to investigate the whistleblower's complaint. The company secretary provides all the resources needed by this committee to conduct a thorough investigation. Semi may be concerned about the possibility of the friends and sympathizers of the accused board member our officer being appointed to such an investigation committee. If so, SEBI may take over the responsibility of appointing such a committee. After all, you do not, hopefully you do not get too many whistleblower complaints in a year. If the investigation concludes that the board and the officers of the company did not perform their fiduciary duties 
and contributed to a governance deficit by omission or commission, the investigating committee recommends to the shareholders that a penalty must be paid by the entire board and by the concerned officers. Unfortunately, the white collar guilty people in India do not pay any penalty for their crimes and are just asked to resign. This is not a good idea. SEBI must black blacklist these board members and officers. The shareholders must vote them out. In addition, the shareholders must law back 100% of the compensation, all the fee received by the board and the officers during the tenure of the incident reported by the whistleblower. SEBI may consider imposing some additional penalties. Let me stop here. Fantastic. A lot of uh, technical details also coming in there and, and um, advises. Uh, uh, you talked about board and you know the role of, uh, of of how critical the board and the structure it can be. What should be the level of involvement of the board in terms of banks' business strategies, key personal decisions, as well as internal organization? And a leading question, sir, there is. How can the banks ensure that there is no overlap and subsequent conflict between the responsibilities of the board and the senior management? The primary functions of a bank board include ensuring a robust quality growth of both the top line and the bottom line of the bank using legal and ethical means protecting and enhancing the reputation of the bank, reviewing, critiquing, and improving the strategy presented by the management, setting clear KPIs for the CXOs and other officers of the bank, recommending a fair and performance-based compensation to the CXOs and other officers of the bank after consulting, key knowledgeable shareholders, as it happens in the case of some well-governed companies in the West, and after obtaining the approval of the shareholders, creating a succession plan for the CXOs and the key officers of the bank, identifying risk, as I pointed out earlier, defining boundary limits for each risk parameter, and taking timely action to mitigate this risk, putting in place systems of information control, checks and balances, and ensuring that they are working well at all points of time, ensuring full compliance of regulations required by every statutory authority of the land, getting capital and revenue budgets prepared and approved after informed discussions. Applying mind, reviewing, approving, acquisitions, mergers, dividends, rights issues, bonus shares, and buyback of shares proposed by the management, addressing shareholder grievance in a fair and transparent manner, and installing a robust whistleblower policy and ensuring its proper functioning to address the compliance complaints of whistleblowers. Board members, in my opinion, have to set aside at least one full day before attending any bank's board meeting, read all the papers, highlight all the important risks and concerns that they notice in the papers. Their main job is to ask deep and well thought out questions and persist till they get a satisfactory answer or till the bank management takes action to correct the lacunae. The areas that they should worry about and ask questions are how the bank is performing on a global scale in market capitalization growth, revenue growth and profit growth, what the bank can learn from the competing banks in performing better than competitors, how the bank can reduce its cost to income ratio, what its NPA is, 
whether the checks and balances for every risk parameter in that the board has identified, whether there are checks and balances for every employee, that is the maker checker concept, whether the boundary limits are defined for every risk parameter, what the customer, employee, and investor satisfaction surveys say, whether all the parameters like customer concentration and sector concentration are within limits, and whether the bank is fully compliant with norms and regulations. They have to particularly raise any issues that appear to be beyond the boundary limits while conducting business. The board should also, as I pointed out earlier, create a list of risk factors and define the boundaries beyond which a red flag will be raised by the system and it is sent to all the board members and all the officers, not just the functional head of a specific function, but it should go to all the uh, functional heads so that the whole bank understands that there is some problem in some area. That's when there will be enough incentive for every function, functional head to, to control these uh, risk factors. The board members should raise these risk factors in the meeting of the board, ensure that their questions are minuted, and check those minutes and ensure that satisfactory answers are obtained. They should also suggest improvements in every area of the functions and the operations of the bank. Now, let me get to the second part of the question. That is, is what is the overlap or is there, how do we know there's no overlap and con conflict between the responsibility of the board and the senior management? Now, first of all, let's remember that governance is deciding to do the right thing and management is about doing that right thing well. So the board's responsibility is to ask if the bank is doing the right thing at all points of time, whether it has the right strategy, whether it has the right ethics, whether it's following the right values, whether it is identifying all risks, and whether that strategy they have used and discussed and developed is earning the bank the right outcomes. There are three key players in any corporate governance system. The shareholders or the owners of the bank in proportion to the number of voting shares they hold in the bank. The board of directors is responsible for the governance of the company. It oversees the management. It is appointed by the shareholders and is therefore accountable to the shareholders. The CXOs and other executive officers form the management of the bank. They run the business and they report the performance of the bank and every risk factor associated with the business to the board of directors periodically. And the board of directors inform the shareholders periodically the primary corporate governance problem, as you all know, is to minimize agency cost. Agency cost is the cost incurred by the management for achieving the objectives of the company as decided by the shareholders. Agency costs tend to be in inflated due to the divergence of interest between the management and the shareholders. In professional managed companies, such costs manifest as the propensity of management leaders to wring out of a weak board high and unjustifiable compensation and perks for themselves and to violate the rules of the bank to use the bank's resources for their personal benefits and comforts. 
in the case of promoter based or promoter managed banks this problem generally manifests as the asymmetry of benefits created by these owner managers in their favor and against other shareholders a typical example would be the use of the funds of a listed company or bank owned partially by an owner manager to fund the growth of the of a bank or a company held wholly or to a large extent by the owner manager his or her family and friend this is generally what is called a related party transaction that is conducting the company's financial transactions with either a senior management staff or his or her relatives or friends generally such transactions result in inflated costs and financial damages to the bank or the company and favor the other party in the transaction many a time related party transactions involve paying unusually large severance payment beyond the contracted amount to an officer of the bank or the company to buy his or her silence the duty of the board is to apply their mind and prevent such transactions if each director understands his or her role spends time to study the the papers that are sent to him or her applies his or her mind be prepared to act and do not do anything unethical in their actions then there will be no conflict of interest and overlap of authority the best way to avoid doing anything unethical is to ask the question as i said right in the beginning whether the action of the board member or the cso would enhance or harm respect for the individual and the bank it is best to remember the canada adage that in the end a thief's wife will become a widow let me stop here thank you very much sir at this moment uh, while i move to the last question that i have for you sir uh, may i also request uh, the audiences we have uh, some of the tallest leaders from the banking fraternity join joining us today please share your questions in the chat and we will take them right after uh the last question which is just coming up so uh mr murthy my last question to you would be you talk about leadership the board and the role there when as a board director how does one recognize and manage conflicts of interest within an organization conflict of interest as i explained earlier is using corporate resources for personal benefits that's the primary conflict so conflict of interest in other words doing something unethical doing something illegal which involves doing what you are not supposed to do that is using the corporate or the bank's resources in an unethical or illegal form to obtain some benefit either pecuniary or benefit in kind for oneself now right in the beginning when i started answering your first question i told you that it is all a question of culture it is what culture one comes from it is what one's parents have taught it is what one's siblings have taught it is what one's grandparents have taught it is what one's teachers have taught it is what one's early bosses have taught i have learned so much from my parents my grandparents my siblings my my bosses my teachers and my even from my anger colleagues because we at infosys create 
created a culture where nobody was afraid of saying that i don't agree with this because this is not good for the company they could do it either through email or walk into any of our offices because our doors were always open only when i was in a meeting with somebody they would not come in but if there is nobody in the room because the doors were always open they would walk in and say i don't agree with what is happening i think once you create such a culture once you have clearly understood i spoke about it in answer to the last question what are the duties and the authorities vested in board members and what are the duties and authorities rested in the hands of the management that rests in the hands of the management then you don't cross your boundary you don't go and do what the management is supposed to do management will not go and do what the board members are supposed to do most problems have happened only when the management tries to do the board's work and the board's work try the board does uh, tries to do the work of the management so i think as long as you have written it down very clearly and as long as the chairman ensures that once in 6 months at least an hour is spent in discussion on the do's and don'ts of the board and at least once in 6 months the senior management the ceo of the bank spends time with all his functional heads and says what are the things they can do what are the things they should not do what is good for the bank what is not good for the bank i personally believe that we would have created some deterrents fantastic sir thank you very much what an enlightening session and i'm i'm, I'm just going to remember those 10 the the titles and the subtitles that you talked about from the book winners never cheat so that's corporate governance for you now may i open the floor for question and vishal i know that you've been waiting in the wings for a long time to ask your first question over to you vishal thanks deepshika uh and uh, thank you sir i mean it's quite mesmerizing uh, you sort of covered uh, every single thing from the social aspect of it to the technology use uh, to the roles and responsibility of uh, the board members parenting i think uh, and and this one hour probably would be a much lesser time uh, more time has to be sort of uh, uh, shared between uh, to together your thoughts sir so Uh, with that i just want to quickly touch upon two important points uh, before i uh, ask the question which is which is very related to what i'm just going to talk about uh, you yeah. just talked about use of technology so from technology perspective the first thing uh, focus on uh, data driven compliance right so move from reactive to proactive approach that is uh, power of uh, data together with predictive uh, ai model will help drive compliance more seamlessly that's what uh, probably Uh, can be done identifying potential issues lot before uh, it can happen so those are the aspects probably can be driven using data analytics and ai kind of platform uh, second is on the regulatory reform uh, <clears throat> so world is completely going through massive reform right now if you look at it right so we have seen open banking wave uh, gdpr in europe uh, new banking uh, licenses sme banking account aggregation all those kind of thing happening across uh, asia and uh, india right so it seems regulator has to catch up uh, to new banking products and services and be vigilant about data and consent management uh, so now that brings to uh, my question uh, uh, mr murthy uh so sir as you quoted in past that we we believe in god everyone else must bring your data so from that would you agree that more data and openness will force corporate governance standard to improve since it will be uh, impossible to close one's eye if board is added by credible data uh, data points so uh, what's your thoughts sir no i think i entirely agree with you that transparency is what brings better accountability now transparency is what democratize democratizes in some sense power to 
correct mistakes power to do the right thing now that transparency is possible only if the data as required by the shareholders without violating the rules of you know uh, uh, share price you know without without uh, following the uh, selective uh, disclosure of uh, information etc etc if you follow those principles and if you provide whatever data the shareholders ask for i think by and large such banks such corporations will be governed better now we all know why harshal mehta scam happened it happened because at that point of time computers were not used extensively in banks anything could be done those brs you know i mean were all written in hand <laughs> what was fake what was correct and securities were not de de dematerialized i mean all these things led to huge problems so therefore if you use technology if you provide if you enhance transparency if you sit down with shareholders and functional experts and they then decide on what are the questions that are most important for shareholders to know that the bank or the company is being run properly and then provide those answers you know every quarter then i do believe that the banks and the corporations can be run better than what is happening today excellent thank you very much uh, uh, i'm putting up for that uh, response rajkiran ji any any thoughts from you any questions from you thank you ma'am uh, sir listening to you uh, was a dream come true for us actually being a public sector bank uh, uh, one of the things which hit us uh, which you started with is a cultural transformation yeah you mentioned that uh, cultural transformation is the basis on which all other transformation will take place and uh, i think that is the strongest statement i heard and and that is very very true now in public sector setup the cultural transformation is not that easy because the leadership uh, floats uh, uh, like for 3 to 5 years maximum because there is a no long term leadership at the top level the boards are mostly appointed by the government so and even at the staff level employee level and all that high unionization a uh, different uh, level of motivations so what kind of cultural transformation we can think of in public sector setup even though certain experiments you are aware uh, has happened in the last few years but nothing has taken deep roots for the cultural transformation so sir what are your suggestions for us for starting some strong cultural transformation in public sector banks you know i think this is a very complicated very detailed question that will take probably a few days to discuss and debate however let me summarize quickly i think as mahatma gandhi pointed out to all of us leadership by example is what will bring confidence to everybody in the community in in the country on what is good and what is not good therefore leaders in both the political arena and the bureaucracy arena at the central government level and the state government level have to realize what is good governance and how to ensure that the the the, the hard and money of the central government and the state government 
is not wasted on the wrong uh, toss. So therefore, there will have to be a, a, a committee consisting of the highly respected members of the society who can be requested to form to, to, to decide on how the banking system can be governed, how it can be delinked from the government, how the, the, the interference from the state capital and the center can, can be eliminated, how the chairman of the board has can hold the CEO fully accountable, how the period of appointment, the tenure of the appointment of the CEO and the board can be decided by the boards themselves. If we did all these things, I believe that India can improve. Let me tell you, this is not impossible. For example, once upon a time, at IIM and IITs, the members of the governing board were appointed by Delhi. And the chairman had no control over any of these people because he was not appointing them. They were not answerable to him. Number two, they would put in all kinds of people. But today, I am told that the, the appointment of the chairman and the members of the board is primarily handled by the boards themselves. And that the central government does not play a role in these major tasks. I think as long as, as we can do some of these things, even in the banking sector, even though it's understandable that bank that the government holds uh, a large percentage, if not 100%, in many uh, public sector banks. After all, let's remember this is all the money of the public. It is not money of the central government. It is the money of the public. Therefore, highly respected and accomplished people can be charged with the responsibility of running these banks with full freedom, with a certain tenure that they then say that you know, can be acceptable to the society and certain processes that enhance fairness, transparency and accountability. If it happens, I believe that this country can mitigate the problems that we are seeing. Otherwise, what happens is, you know, so many public sector units are making so so many thousands of crores of losses every year. You know, Air India, poor thing, you know, has been making so many, so much of losses. So I think it is time that we all come together as one nation. It doesn't matter whether you belong to party A, party B, party C, whether you are in the government, outside the government. What matters is whether you are interested in the betterment of the nation. If people in the government and people, citizens, both of them come to realize that we are the people who have to make this nation better. Therefore, we will come together. We will sit down in an environment of peace, harmony, and educated discussions, enlightened discussions, and we will come out with solutions that make the country better, that make our institutions strong. I think then there is definitely a possibility that our institutions will be as good as the best in the world. So what we need to do as concerned citizens is to talk about these issues in a very objective, very peaceful, very harmonious, very well-meaning way, ways, because the government will also listen if we are, 
if we are interested in peaceful solution of these issues if we are interested in solving the problem if we show as much interest in these things as the government is showing why will they not accept so i think we will the leaders of the society the respected members of the society should come together and then say look we want to add value to you to the government in making our banking institutions the best in the world i think there there are possibilities great so possibilities abound raj kiran ji wonderful question coming in from you sir um now i know we are running out of time but uh, so there are questions which uh, which which if i if we can quickly take uh, we have vinci lewis palestry asking a question independent directors are playing a good role in corporate governance shall we insist the government to increase the number of independent directors in the board from the present level to 50% no i think uh, i don't know at least that infosys right from the early days we have had a, the number of independent directors higher than the number of executive directors number of uh, full time directors and that was also a requirement on nasdaq and as you know we started uh, reporting in us gap from 1995 or so so we have done that so i was under the impression that the number of independent directors is always higher however let's not let's not kid ourselves it's just not the number of independent directors that matters the quality of independent directors the value system of independent directors whether they are well educated in your business whether they are interested in spending adequate money adequate, sorry, adequate time in in governing the institution i think those things are very important but i agree with you that we will have to uh, make the number of independent directors higher than the number of the the full time directors but then in a public sector bank i don't know i mean how that works so i am not in a position to comment on that great thank you so much sir so in the paucity of time this is the last question that we would take uh, of the evening uh, which is coming from bala chandra by v bala chandra asks performance evaluation of directors and the board in india is of very recent origin how do you make it more meaningful you know what we did at infosys was we looked at the governance in a very detailed way as early as 98 or so or 97 and we came out with a set of kpis and we did a peer evaluation that is i will uh, evaluate you on those 10 kpis you evaluate me on those 10 kpis etc etc the chairman generally sat with each member of the board if there are any weaknesses pointed out by the rest of the board members then he would sit down and see how those weaknesses can be handled but if those weaknesses can continue then he would very nicely very respectfully very courteously request that person to to exit the board now in so far as the the chairman was concerned the chairperson it was done by the lead independent director and because the lead independent director represented the senior most and the most informed independent director of the company he would be the one who would sit down with the chairperson then say look we the independent directors 
we believe that these are your areas of strength and these are your areas of weaknesses we would request you to kindly uh take these issues very seriously and put in some hard work and improve upon it so that was a strong message coming from the lead independent director and that gave enough incentive for the chairperson to improve his or her own performance so i think uh, that is the best because after all who are the people who are actually observing each of the members of the board in action it is the other members of the board because these people meet once a quarter or maybe in the case of a bank six times eight times in a year and the rest of them are observing me i have i have i read all the documents sent to me am i asking meaningful questions am i you know spending the time of the board on what is of strategic importance have i identified the risk etc are there are there risk parameters which come under my own uh, uh, committee that i have not looked at etc etc and then they would evaluate me so i think peer evaluation is a good one but one thing i must say that in india our culture is we don't want any unpleasantness in any situation we don't mind hiding the problems under the carpet because i want to be pleasant to you and you want to be pleasant to me we let down the institution but we don't want to create any unpleasantness that again brings me back to the cultural transformation on the other hand i have found i have worked i have been on the board of several corporations in the west and i have found that they don't mind saying it openly that this is not a good thing that that mr x or miss y has done this has to be corrected etc etc that i think that is a cultural transformation that i don't know i mean how how much time it will take for that culture to change mm -hmm. wonderful so i'm i'm just a small little guilty i missed one question with your kind permission sure. the last question sure 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 gopal singh gosai asks what can be the few do's and don'ts when you are charged for a corporate governance issue no as i said look i pointed out if i am a member of the board or if i am a cxo or an officer of the bank of the company then the board must recuse itself completely and instruct the company secretary that he they can and the board can suggest a few respected leaders in the society and some of them could be in the top 10 shareholders and then they will form a committee the company secretary will provide all the assistance to those people and the board should completely recuse itself and not just the board the board and the cxos generally the cxos are part of the board that's why i'm saying the board but even if they are not part of all the officers of the bank officers of the company and the cxos and the board members should be completely bypassed and the this committee of respected citizens and some of the top 10 shareholders of the institution will identify a competent lawyer that lawyer will be answerable only to this committee and they will define the terms of the the investigation and then they will come to the conclusion whether the board had done something wrong or whether the officers of the company of the bank or the company had done something wrong and if they had done something wrong 
then I have already said, then they should be held accountable. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Now may I again go back to the man who made it all possible, Sunil Mehta ji. Uh, the floor is all yours. Please uh, extend your regards to Mr. Murthy and uh, close the today's session for us. Thank you, sir. Uh, we were really overwhelmed uh, with your deliberations coming from your experience and your heart. And uh, I think it has given us a, a new uh, sense of light or thinking in our boardrooms. Uh, our entire the banking community will get benefit from your insight and especially uh, you could find time for us and uh, give your so much share your good uh, experiences so uh, we remain indebted to you i'm equally thankful to uh, deep shikha ji is from um, speaking and uh, mr himanshu uh, that uh, they made it uh, possible to bring you on board uh, addresses and we are equally thankful to mr vishal dikshit the uh, md of the cap germany uh, was uh, uh, who collaborated with us and on organizing this event sir uh, we are really uh, overwhelmed and uh, we really want uh, to, to get a second dose of this uh, whenever we get an opportunity and uh, i'm really thankful to all my uh, banker colleagues who have joined and uh, taken the benefit uh, of the deliberations today thank you all for making it possible it will be a great great learning for all of us and I'm equally thankful to uh, our chairman uh, Rajkiran Raiji uh, for uh, supporting the entire initiative. Thank you all. Thanks a lot, uh, Sunilji. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks to everybody else. Thanks to the chairman. Thanks to everybody.